Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and tonight we'll read verses 10 through 13, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And tonight uh, is the start of a new series uh, on spiritual warfare. Uh, and tonight the message is living with a warfare mentality. Living with a warfare mentality. And this is not uh, the main text. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10-13 is going to be one of our texts tonight. This is not going to be a message on the armor of God. There will be a time for that. But that is not it tonight. We'll have a few different uh, key texts uh, from the uh, scripture tonight. Living with a warfare mentality. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And I do pray that you would help us to be off to a good start on this series. Such a, that's always an important subject, but tonight uh, I believe it's a very uh, timely uh, subject um, in the days in which we live, in the life of our church. And, and as we go forward here, Lord, I pray that uh, this would be uh, profitable for the hearer and, and for me as well. And Lord, I pray that you would um, uh, work in each heart and life, that this would uh, be the, the scriptures would, would change us, mold us, make us what you want us to be in this area of spiritual warfare. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would latch on to these truths, latch on to this subject, and uh, for your honor and glory, and Lord, I pray that you would use this in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The question is, how do you view life? How do you view life? Um, every person lives life in a certain, with a certain state of mind, a frame of mind. Um, some live in a state of anxiety. They just live life, they're always anxious, always worried. Others live in a state of peace and happiness and tranquility. Uh, others live in a state of confusion. Um, some people, many people, live with the mindset of always pursuing pleasure and just enjoying life. Just enjoy life, pursue pleasure. That's what life's all about, is just enjoy life. And, and that, it makes, uh, it's, and that, by the way, that's not just for the world, the, the lost world. That's also, that type of philosophy also is in many Christians' lives as well. Just, just enjoy life. Just have the, enjoy the pleasures of life. That's, that's what life's about, is, is just, we, we know God, let's just enjoy God, let's just enjoy life and what we've been given. And uh, certainly nothing wrong with uh, enjoying things that we've been given in life, but it, that some people will live with that mindset that that's what that's really what their life is about. I'm just going to enjoy life. I'm just going to pursue pleasure. There's another way of thinking, and that is, uh, and I'm sure we could maybe you could fill in the blanks of uh, more states of mind, frames of mind that people live with uh, their focus in life. But another way of thinking besides pursuing pleasure and just enjoying life, is having a warfare mentality. Now, for us to really properly uh, deal with this subject of spiritual warfare, we first have to deal with the mentality in which we live, the mentality with which we live. Uh, because if we do not have a warfare mentality, we will not be in a position to effectively wage a good warfare in the Christian life. You just can't do it if you don't have a warfare mentality. And that's why this is the first message of this series. There are important similarities. Now, for those of you who've uh, been in the military, and especially those who, who maybe have seen combat, been out on the battlefield, then you'll see, uh, probably would see important similarities between a mentality for that kind of warfare and spiritual warfare. There, there are a lot of similarities. Now, there are some differences, but there are a lot of key similarities between physical warfare and spiritual warfare. And one of those similarities is having a warfare mentality. A warfare mentality. You're zeroed in, you're disciplined, you're focused on what you're facing in your life. Now, if you're going out on the battlefield and uh, 
You know, think, think about a war from the past. It could be from a long, long time ago, the Revolutionary War. You could think of the Civil War, maybe more recent wars in the last hundred or so years. And every time, anybody who went into that with not having a warfare mentality was probably not going to do very well. Now, um, today's Father's Day, and in and, and two weeks is the, well, we, just, we had... Um, we had uh, Memorial Day at the end of uh, May, and we have Father's Day today. We have Fourth of July, and now we have a new holiday, Juneteenth, and that's a day of uh, celebration for many people. And, uh, and uh, so in these holidays, what do people like to do on holidays? They like to, well, let's, let's have a picnic. Let's have a barbecue. Let's have uh, a good time. Let's, let's sit back and enjoy and, and, and have a good time. Now, if you had, if you lived your life that way, or let me just put it this way, if, if the soldier who's ready to go to battle, if that's the way, the approach he took on the battlefield, how long would he last on the battlefield? Not very long, probably. But you know what? If Christians on the spiritual battlefield live with that mentality, they're not going to last very long on the battlefield either. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a time for a day of celebration, a day of enjoyment, a day of picnics, you know, here and there. But, but we live in a society, it's, it's chasing pleasure, chasing pleasure, chasing pleasure. That's, what, that's, that's, that's our society. Just, just do what feels good, do what you enjoy, and that's what you need to focus on in life. That runs counter, though, to the mentality God wants for his people to have. Not to say we can't enjoy life, not to say we can't uh, uh, have a good time, and not to say there are... Uh, not pleasures in life, but you know, is for the Christian, we need to recognize that the greatest pleasure comes from being in the center of God's will and glorifying Him. So our standard of pleasure is going to be should be different than what the world's standard of pleasure is. So tonight, the focus will not be on the elements of spiritual warfare. As I said, we're not going to be covering the whole armor of God tonight. Uh, the elements of spiritual warfare, we'll, we'll get into that but on the necessity of a warfare mentality and what that means in our lives. Now, the subject of spiritual warfare um, has often been yielded and maybe is latched on the most by the charismatics who get some of it right but then take certain things too far and do the subject a disservice. And so there are times where you know, just non-charismatic, Bible-believing Christians would, would kind of shy away from the subject of spiritual warfare because of the extremes, the excesses that some have taken it in, uh, in Christianity. And so it gets turned into something mystical rather than ta- up taking biblical principles and applying biblical principles to the aspect of spiritual warfare. So, that, so it kind of turns some people off. But just because someone maybe takes a subject and misuses it or maybe is a little uh, is somewhat excessive with it or maybe a li- off base about it does not mean that we just ignore the subject altogether. Uh, that would be, that's a great danger to do that. We need to just simply look at it biblically with, as we would with anything else, just look at the truth of Scripture and obey the truth of Scripture. And so first, starting in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, regarding living and developing a warfare, uh, developing and living with a warfare mentality, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Spiritual warfare is not to be fought, and we cannot fight it in our own strength. He's telling the church there at Ephesus, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you're going to have the strength to go on, uh, if you're going to uh, be able to live the life, I mean, the last few chapters were spent telling them, here's what the practical Christian life looks like. And if you're going to be strong, it has to be being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It has to be His strength working in and through us and not our own strength. And if you're going to engage in spiritual warfare, and the following verses are about spiritual warfare, If we're going to engage in that, it has to be in God's strength and not in our own strength. Uh, Verse 11, the Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
And so here, uh, this is actually a command. This is a command. Put on the whole armor of God. It's not just simply, here's some principles for life, and you, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to pick. No, he says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand, uh, to stand against the wiles of the devil. So engaging in spiritual warfare is a command from God, and whether you engage in it or not, you are in it. You are in it. If you are a Christian, if you've trusted Christ your Savior, you are dealing with spiritual warfare. By the way, just simply a person getting saved involves spiritual warfare. Because yeah. we know the devil doesn't want people to be saved. He loves to keep the lost blinded. But once you get saved, then you are in definitely engaged in spiritual warfare because what he especially likes to do, it's, 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 easy, it's not that hard for the devil to keep the lost blinded, but what he really likes to focus his efforts on is then once a person is saved, render them useless and ineffective for God and keep them from bringing him glory. And that's where he spends a lot of his efforts, a lot of his attacks. And by the way, one of the reasons why the devil attacks churches so much is that Christ paid for the church with his own blood. And so he loves to attack churches because that's a special emphasis in God's program. And so the devil's going to really try to focus on that. But then how does he do? What does he do? Well, in churches, you could... You could um, you could maybe attack the church as a whole, but also what the devil also likes to do, he, he, he works in the homes, and in the uh, message from this morning talking about the home and the importance of training children, teaching children in the home, uh, and how important the homes are to the church and how important the church is to the home. Uh, if, he can, if he can start to work in the homes that are part of the church, then he can effectively have access into the church. Because a church is going to be only as strong as the homes that make up the church. I mean, I can get up here and I can have, um, you know, I, I printed our statement of faith off for someone today and, and gave it to them. And, you know, I could, we, you, I could go right down the line of our statement of faith and preach all the right things. And I could wax eloquent, as eloquent as I wax. Um, and I could, pre I could just go right down the, the list and say, wow, that, that church, wow, they, they've got... They've got solid teaching, doctrinal, uh, solid teaching from the Word of God. But simply just someone getting up and teaching and preaching, that, that's very important. But what's the, what are the conditions of the homes that make up the church? That's what really makes the difference as to how far that church is going to go, what that church is going to be like as the years go on. And so the devil likes to uh, really attack Christians and keep them from living a God-honoring life, a life that brings glory, a fruitful, productive Christian life. So whatever, whether you engage in it or not, you are in it, one way or another. And no matter what you do, the devil's going to work his wiles. Some people, I'm just going to keep my hands off and, and I'm, I'm not going to engage in it. You, you, might, you might see maybe less warfare. You might see fewer battles. Because if you're already surrendering, if you've already surrendered, you really have not of much threat to the devil. The ones that are of the greatest threat to the devil are the ones who are actually pressing forward, recognizing it is a warfare, and they are engaging in that warfare. And they are the greatest threat to the devil. So don't be surprised when you as a person or in your household or in, especially in churches, when a church tries to go forward for the Lord, that there is extra warfare that, that arises because, wait a minute, no, this church is trying to do something for God rather than just sitting back and being settled, enjoying life, enjoying the Christian life. Those churches are not of great threat to the devil. And the devil is going to have his work as well as with them. He just maybe can do it in different ways and let circumstances play out. But no matter what you do, the devil works his wiles. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it's, it's a given that there, the, there's going to be the wiles of the devil. His craftiness, his tools that he uses, his trickery. And then number th uh, verse number uh, 12, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And tonight we're not getting into who 
so much who the enemy is, but here we're reminded who our enemy is not and then who our enemy is. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. So that's the difference between the spiritual battle and a military type battle is military type battle is strict. It's, it's much of it, I should say much of it is flesh and blood. Some of it is psychological. There's psychological warfare that goes on. But, um, and certainly to a certain degree, depending on who's fighting and what it's about, there could be some spiritual warfare involved in that. But it's different in that this is not a flesh and blood battle. With, with warfare, uh, military warfare, that's primarily flesh and blood. I mean, you're, you're fighting against people. But in spiritual warfare, reminded of who our enemy is, and, and we'll get into that more specifically as we go on in this series. But that's Paul's reminding the church at Ephesus there. And in verse 13, he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, there are different ideas of what this evil day is. Is this, uh, is this day as far as just an evil age? Is this a, a long period of time? Is this, uh, is this a, a particular day, a specific day when you face those extra attacks? Well, you know, um, we do face an age of evil, and we also face a specific day of evil. That there, there comes a time when, when the devil has marked okay, I'm going to attack them. Here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And so we live, we, we need this for the, an age of evil, and we also need this for the evil day of a specific day when that evil especially comes upon us. And it says, having done all to stand. And so the third part point in this particular passage is that you can res, uh, you can res, withstand excuse me you can withstand and stand by engaging in spiritual warfare and Paul's trying to help them out here because he's saying if you put on the whole armor of God you'll be able to withstand in the evil day and stand stand so withstand is to resist to stand against or oppose. But to stand is to remain or abide. And if you have the whole armor of God, you can do both. You can withstand, because there comes a point in time where the battle comes to you and you are going forward and the battle comes to you that you have to oppose the forces of darkness. And then at the same time, it's not just about opposing, it's a matter of being able to stand. It's a matter of being able to abide and remain and so, I mean, you could, you could withstand. I mean, you could, you could, you could put up with all the, the, the battering of the, the enemy uh, and, and resist that, stand against that, but also just be able to stand. I'm going to stand. I'm not just withstand. I'm standing. And you can do both here by engaging in spiritual warfare, by putting on the whole armor of God. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So there we see once again, be strong, be strong. But once again, not in ourselves, it is in the Lord. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Spiritual warfare involves, uh, actually let me keep reading here before we get into that. There are thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So let me tell you what, if, if there was... Um, now I often, I often uh, we, we use... Uh, 1 Timothy 3, particularly as, as the, um, uh, you know, here are the qualifications of a bishop. If a man desire the office, here, so here's, here's the job description, right? here are the qualifications. But what about, a, what about a job description? If we had a job description of a pastor, well, Paul's talking to Timothy, who was a pastor, and young pastor in, in the faith, and, uh, or in, in age, and, and um, 
and growing up and learning and developing and maturing. Paul's trying to help him with this in, in leadership. And he says, thou therefore endure hardness. That would be, uh, that, should, that should be on, if, if, a, if a church is looking for a pastor, okay, here's, here's, what we're, here's what the job entails. And you can go down through the list. Yeah, you need to be able to properly administrate and you know, watch over the people, be a good shepherd, and all of those things. You need to preach the word. You need to be doctrinally sound. You need to do that. And then one of them should be endure hardness. You're going to have to endure hardness. What is hardness? Now, it's the hardships and trials. So he, didn't, he, he was just saying, a matter of factly, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The, the hardships and the trials are going to come. And I think maybe one of the reasons why we've seen t- so many churches uh, uh, fall away and apostatize is because maybe there's a lot of pastors who forgot that being a pastor involves enduring hardness. And so let's do everything we can to avoid any hardness whatsoever Let's just sit back. Let's enjoy life. Let's all just celebrate Jesus, and we're not going to get into any type of battles and conflicts and, and uh, spirit, particularly spiritual battles. Not, we, should, we should avoid the flesh and blood battles. But the spiritual battles, we're not going to get into, uh, we're not going to get into that. We're just, we're just here to enjoy life. God's going to bless us. God's going to shed His grace upon us so abundantly. And, and boy, now I got a great... Uh, I got a great, uh, got a great thing going here. You know, some of these megachurch uh, pastors that... You know, they have a great thing going. They're popular, they're hip, they're cool, and have no mind whatsoever for hardships or spiritual warfare. Because they're all about enjoying life. And so pastors, as, as he's saying here, talking to Timothy, pastors such as Timothy face the bulk of it. Face the bulk of it. There are a lot of difficulties, there are a lot of hardships and challenges to being a pastor. And a lot of it is, is uh, well, it involves spiritual warfare. And the fact is, and I, I find it interesting that he said, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So there is this being the soldier, but in light of the fact that here's what you're supposed to do, commit these things, what you've heard from me, commit to, to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also, is that in, it's worthwhile enduring the hardness if you're able to accomplish that goal, if you're able to accomplish that objective. And, you know, you could maybe turn it around and say, you know, if you're going to try to accomplish that objective, it involves a lot of hardness, enduring hardness. Because it's, and, and it's, it's a difficult, it's, it's an, an important, it's a, actually, that's, it's, it's not just important, it's vital. Because the pastor's job is to teach other faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And that is what the devil attacks the most. Because the fact is, if there's a pastor who's standing up in front of everybody, he might have the most sound doctrine. He might have the... But if he's not able to teach other faithful men, he shall be able to teach others also. Once that pastor's off the scene, oh boy, now the devil can really have fun. But if you've got a church full of people who have been taught, faithful men, here it's talking about the men, faithful men who've been taught and have had the great doctrines of God's word passed down, yeah, the devil can try to pick off the pastor, but then he's got to deal with the other men who are grounded in the sound doctrine. That's why there's so much spiritual warfare when it comes to doctrine. Doctrine. Sound doctrine. That's why the devil doesn't want there to be faithful men who can be taught. He wants men to be fooling around and being immoral and get and just living for pleasure and living it up for themselves and what, whatever, whatever men do, <laughs> you know, the, the, the other things men do. And not in a position, not faithful, uh, not able to be relied upon to be entrusted then with sound doctrine and then the devil stops things right in his tracks in its tracks and so there's a bulk of hardship there's a bulk of of uh uh, hardness but but you he, he says be strong in the grace that is in christ jesus so we need special strength that comes from the grace of god so that then we accomplish that mission of teaching faithful men who can be able to who be able to teach others also and then 
and therefore endure hardness. You can do this. In other words, it's worth the hardness for the sake of, by God's grace, being able to teach others and press on. Uh, verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Spiritual warfare requires sacrifice. And once again, this is specifically written to a pastor, and I realize there's a, there's a greater level of sacrifice that is required uh, from pastors than would be for someone who is in a congregation or a Christian who's not a pastor. There's just certain things that come with the territory. But at the same time, um, when Paul was talking to the church at Ephesus, he wasn't just talking to the pastors there. It was to the church at Ephesus, and he was saying, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wild devil. So spiritual warfare is not just for the pastors. In here we have the reference specifically to a pastor. But in Ephesians, it was written to the church. Spiritual warfare is for everybody. Spiritual warfare is for all the Christians. But there's a certain, and there's a principle here, so especially it applies to the pastor, but here he's, he's giving a broader principle about warfare in general. No man that worth. Now, he's talking about warfare in general, but then he's specifically speaking to him as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so he says, No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. It is all for pleasing the one who has enlisted us. And when you're in the military today, I would imagine that uh, one of the objectives would be, boy, I need to, I need to please my superiors in, uh, in the military. Did you, did you, uh, did you want to do that, Russ? You wanted to please your superiors? Or did you not care? Wanted you wanted to please your superiors? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, who enlisted us? As Christians, the Lord Jesus Christ, we should want to please Him. And so part of the spiritual warfare is recognizing the principle, and this comes along with the mindset, living with a warfare mentality, that if, if we have a warfare mentality, it's going to mean certain things for our lives that are different than if we didn't have a warfare mentality. And uh, John Gill said, he's talking about, with civil affairs in distinction from military ones, the Roman soldiers might not follow any trade or, or business of life or be concerned in husbandry or merchandise of any sort, but were wholly to attend to military exercises and to the orders of their general. For to be employed in any secular business was reckoned an entangling of them, a taking of them off from and an hindrance to their military discipline. And by this, the apostle suggests that Christ's people, his soldiers, and especially his ministers, should not be involved and implicated in worldly affairs and cares. For no man can serve two masters, God and mammon, but should wholly give up themselves to the work and service to which they are called, and be ready to part with all worldly enjoyments, and cheerfully suffer the loss of all things when called to it for the sake of Christ and his gospel. His captain or general who has enlisted him, enrolled and registered him among his soldiers, whom to please should be his chief concern as it should be the principal thing attended to by a Christian soldier or minister of the gospel, not to please men nor to please himself by seeking his own ease and rest, his worldly emoluments and advantages, but to please the Lord Christ in whose name, in whose book his name is written. And there are certain things that I have a harder and harder time doing, um, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian, where I get less and less enjoyment out of that much of the world would just think, yeah, that's, that's fine, just enjoy life. But as I am increasingly aware of the reality of the increased level of warfare, there's times I, I, I can, it, it's hard to ever, I don't know who should ever, hard to really shift gears and turn that. If I could say, turn that off for a bit. Boy, just, just, just enjoy life and just, uh, just, just forget about all the, the, the other things, the, 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 the responsibilities. The... And uh, that can be a hard thing to do because it requires sacrifice. 
Uh, it requires maybe giving up some things, some worldly affairs and cares that the average person wouldn't think anything about. And that's, that's especially true for the ministers of the gospel, but it's also true, I believe, for every Christian, that as Christians, there should be a difference in what we find our enjoyment and satisfaction in. And I'm not saying there's never a time for... There, there's a difference between a time for rest and refreshment and rejuvenation that is necessary for anyone, and soldiers included, and being entangled with worldly affairs and cares to such an extent it hinders your waging a good warfare as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And the more entangled a minister or pastor gets in, and a Christian gets uh, in, entangled with them, the more you're weighed down with the cares of this life that affect your ability to wage a good warfare. Um, and what should our motivation be? Ready to part with all worldly enjoyments. Cheerfully suffer the loss of all things, as he says here, when called to it for the sake of Christ and his gospel. That there are certain things that as Christians that we do differently, we think differently, and that it becomes less and less about our enjoyment of life and our comfort and more about the mission uh, that the commander, the general, has for us here on this earth. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I will just say, um, if our mentality, if our, if our mindset is right, if our state of mind, if, if how we view life is right, as a, if we have a spiritual warfare mentality, I'll just be honest with you, it's getting easier and easier not to be entangled with the affairs, the worldly enjoyments and cares of this life. Why? Because I just see how much worse the world is getting. Yeah. Why would I want to be entangled with that? Yes, there's business we have to in, attend to in this world, but that's, that's different than just going about your business and attending to the business because a lot of your business that you have and uh, that you tend to, if we have a warfare mentality, we recognize that's also spiritual warfare. You go to work. I go to work during the weeks. It's got to pay the bills. And, uh, and I've learned to view that as spiritual warfare. As time is just over time, not just where I'm working now, but just view, view it all as spiritual warfare. Um, and I'll tell you, and this, we'll get into the, like I said, we'll get into the elements of spiritual warfare um, later on as we go through the series, but I'll just tell you a recent situation that if I had, if I did not have a warfare mentality, and sometimes even with the warfare mentality, it's easy to overlook some of the little things. Um, where, and I'll just say this example at work, um, we used to, uh, the, the, you know, we have, we, we have a radio in there that uh, we, ha we have playing during the business hours, and, and it was, it was kind of, it was nice to have, the, the, it seemed like where the radio was located, there was only one station that came in, and it didn't play the modern day, just driving, sensual uh, type of music that is, is the pop music of today. It was a lot of older type music that just kind of helped not to have so much uh, of a penetration into your brain cells, let's put it that way. <laughs> and I'm not saying I, it was good music necessarily, I'm not saying it's not music I listen to on my own, but I'm just saying if I had to choose for the less intrusive, mentally intrusive music, that was what was playing. Well, we had to move the radio because it was set up at somebody's station, and so it got moved over to a over to the drive-up window, where it's kind of out of the way. And the uh, person who moved it, they changed the station, and they realized, oh, there's actually the station that that person likes. It's it's on now. Well, it's the main pop station in the area that plays all the, I mean, absolute garbage of garbage music. Because if you actually knew what some of these wor words were and what they mean, 
you'd be like, well, that, that's played on the radio? Yeah. I'm serious. I'm serious. Um, there was a song that I had, for some reason, thought about yesterday, and I looked into what the song actually means, and they play it on the radio, just the regular radio around here. And I'm thinking, it's, it's, it's just most of it is most of the music, most of the pop music is just glorification of fornication is what it is. That's what the pop music is. And um, so and it was the same music that was played when I was at the Greenfield branch. And, and, I, and I could automatically, when, when I noticed the difference in how my mind was processing, because it's more, the type of music it is, it's, it's harder to ignore because of the beat and because of all those things. And if I finally got to the realization, all right, I need to not let my guard down about this, but this is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. Now, what am I going to do about this? Well, I, you know, I could potentially ask them to change the station or what I ended up doing last week, and we'll see what it's like this week. What I ended up doing last week is I just simply turned it down to a level where it was not going to be so intrusive, which helped a lot. That I could just focus on my work, focus on what's going on, and not have it be the focal point of what's going on. And there were other things, there were other things regarding work where I've had to take to the Lord, where I take to the Lord each morning and go in recognizing that this is spiritual warfare. Why? Because there are uh, heaven and hell at stake. There's the gospel at stake, of people's lives at stake who don't know the Lord. And by the way, one of the people I was able to at least give a brief, uh, I mean, very, very brief gospel message as far as just the, the absolute basics of the gospel. And I said, because this person uh, was talking about donating something and, uh, because she was on vacation and she was, she, she was going to donate something that she had sent to where she's on vacation. She didn't want to bring it back with her and all, all this. Anyway, but she said, I'm going to donate this. And she said, that'll be my good deed. And she said, that'll get me to heaven, right? I said, oh, good deeds don't get you to heaven. And she said, oh, it's because of my mouth, you know, my language. Yeah. <laughs> And this person does have a pretty, uh... but I thought, wait a minute, I don't want to leave it at that. I want to make sure that I'm very clear on what does get a person to heaven. And so I gave this very brief summary of that. And I think it kind of went over the person's head. Uh, they don't think they got it. I don't think it was registering. But if you go into something even secular with a warfare mentality, you never know when you might have something right at your foot doorstep that is spiritual warfare. And if you have that mentality, you'll be ready, you'll be better prepared for those moments to recognize it. Because we need to operate with wisdom. And, and we're, like I said, we're going to get into all the weapons of warfare and, and those things coming up here in the next few weeks. But... Um, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, the last passage for tonight. Uh, the Bible says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became, uh, became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection that, let, that's, that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He didn't want to be a hypocrite. He didn't want for him, his life to be a castaway. He didn't want him to be preaching a certain message in his, his life reflecting something different. And this is not as much of a warfare passage, but it does describe the discipline that is necessary to live a fruitful Christian life, which involves warfare. And the comparison we see here, we don't see soldiers being spoken of here. We see athletes. We see 
uh, someone maybe who would be running in the Olympics. And both soldiers and athletes train because they're striving to master what they are doing. And they have to give up some things. There's, there's temperance. There's that self-control. There's that discipline. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. In other words, it's a worldly prize. It's something that's going to, it, it just decays. It's not really, a, it's not of eternal value. But what are we striving for? An incorruptible. Incorruptible. If we're going to live a fruitful life, we need to have, uh, uh, we need to be trained. We need to be disciplined. We need to be temperate. And keep, un, he says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Bring it into subjection. What does that mean? It means you are not being guided and letting the lust of your flesh, letting your mind run away with itself and control you. It means you are controlling it. Well, I mean, by God's grace, by the fruit of the Spirit and uh, the temperance and, and the control of the Holy Spirit. So it's not simply us human, humanistically. But, but, it's, but to put it in a human way, it's not, it's, it's not our minds and lust controlling us and our emotions controlling us. It's us keeping them under subjection. That is a powerful principle for the Christian life and, wa and especially waging warfare. Now, I meant to bring something with me. Um, well, I was going to bring something that was, looked like a, 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 either a gun or a, not a real gun. but and, um, Although I did get my, by the way, I got my firearms card uh, the other day, yesterday. So, um, but, so... He says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, but so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Now, when I say about bringing in subjection, now if you have a firearm, you need to keep that firearm under subjection. You can't be waving it around and just going crazy with it. And... No, you keep, you keep it, you bring it into subjection. That's a weapon of warfare, is a firearm. You, you, keep, you bring it into subjection. Our bodies, our minds, are what are used that we have and we engage in warfare, spiritual warfare. And those need to be kept under subjection, not out of control. And we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's influence and touch in our life to help us with that. It's not about us forcing it and just burning ourselves out in it. It's we need God's grace and his help to be strong. But he says here, I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. Can you, can you imagine just burning yourself out, beating the air, you know, fighting and just flailing your arms around? And, 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 he, and, and he knows what the objective is. He's trying to hit the mark. He's trying to be effective in his life, in his ministry, in his Christian life. But both soldiers and athletes train because they are striving to master what they are doing. And for Christians, we should be striving to master the Christian life. That should be what we're striving for. Now, it takes a lot of exercise. It takes a lot of practice. It takes some sacrifice. It takes temperance and self-control. But this is what a warfare mentality needs. It's what comes with a warfare mentality. And... I know that people who take the warfare, spirit, uh, spiritual warfare seriously and people who take the things of God extra, spiritually, uh, extra seriously to the world, especially the lost world, and maybe even to some Christians, might seem like, boy, you're just, boy, you're just too serious. You're just too much of a stick in the mud. You know, why don't you lighten up? Why don't you loosen up and just enjoy life a little bit? Wait a minute. I'm in the middle of a warfare. Why am I lightening up? Why am I lightening up if I'm in the middle of warfare? Now, I realize there's plenty in the Bible about the joy of the Lord. So it's not that we should be grumpy and unhappy and just gruff and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, a grump in life. No, we can have the joy of the Lord. But you know what? God's going to help us to have the joy of the Lord, have peace and happiness while we are in the midst of seriously engaging in spiritual warfare. 
How do how the two mix? Well, it's got to be God that does it. It's got to be God with God's help. That's how the two mix. That you know what? I can find joy in the Christian life, but at the same time, I'm seriously engaging in the work, in the war, while still living a very satisfied life of peace. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. What kind of state of mind do you have? How do you view life? If we're going to be able to go forward in this series on spiritual warfare and we're going to be able to benefit from it and grow through it, we first need to check our mentality, our mindset, and, and, and do some honest uh, soul searching. How do I view life? How do I view life? What am I living for? Am I even in the state of mind where if faced with warfare and spiritual warfare, by the way, we, we are. Can I recognize it? Am I in the frame of mind where I can recognize it and I can properly engage in it? It starts in the mind, in the heart. What is your heart like tonight? What is your mind like tonight? And what does it mean for your life? If you're to commit yourself and say, you know, I I recognize an area where I, I, I recognize some ways I don't have a warfare mentality and I, boy, I really need to change that. I need to take some things in life more seriously Recognize the great battle. And how do you have a warfare mentality without having a state of anxiety? Because you know who you're fighting for. At one of the conferences, the church planning conferences I've attended in the past, it was a small one in Pennsylvania. (laughs) I didn't find this the, uh, the most uplifting song, but I get the point of it. And this, this one, one of the guest uh, preachers, he, he really wanted to sing this song, and it was, uh, I guess, maybe an old gospel song. I'm not sure, but... I'm going to die on the battlefield. I'm going to die in this war. I'm going to die on the battlefield with glory in my song. I'm thinking, boy, that's encouraging. I'm going to die on the battlefield. Boy, that's what I want to be singing. The whole point, though, is, you know what? As long as I'm fighting the right battle... It's okay if I go down fighting because I'm fighting for the right things. It's okay if I go down fighting because I know who I'm fighting for. So I think I think that's the point of the song. I don't I don't know if there's any verses or I think there were verses. I don't remember the verses. I remember thinking, well, yeah, I'm gonna die on the battlefield. Boy, that's that's just great. Oh, I'm I'm encouraged. (laughs) Well, we're thankful with Memorial Day. We're thankful for those people who gave their lives in the service of our country. And they knew the possibility of what, you know, what could happen when they go to war. And so we know in spiritual warfare, things can, get, things can get hard. Things get challenging. There's hardships and trials. Because when you decide you're not going to let the devil alone, if you're, or I should say, if you're not going to let the war alone and you're going to willfully engage in it, the devil then is not going to let you alone. But I remember back to what Ephesians 6 says, is that you can withstand and stand. In other words, it is possible to withstand and stand. God wouldn't tell us to go into something that wasn't possible to withstand and to stand. And so tonight I hope that you commit yourself, if um, maybe you don't live with a warfare mentality, but to recognize that we are in a great spiritual conflict a great war that involves many conflicts. And as we go forward here, we're going to find out who our enemy is. We're going to focus on who our enemy is, but we're also going to focus on who our enemy is not. We're going to focus on the weapons of our warfare and then how we we can properly engage in that warfare. So tonight, let's commit ourselves and let the Lord work and, and examine our hearts as we engage and live. I hope you engage and develop a warfare mentality. And maybe there's someone here who tonight who's never been enlisted in the army. Maybe you're, you've never been saved. You can be saved tonight. And you know, that really should be the message that we give to people when it comes to salvation as, 
oh yeah, get saved and your, your life's just going to be so wonderful from here on out. You experience the rich blessings. No, we need to tell people, oh, there are wonderful blessings of salvation. Yes, there are wonderful blessings, but you also recognize there's a great spiritual battle going on. And if you get saved, you're really putting your, a target on your back for the devil to mess with your life. And there's a spiritual warfare going on, but you can engage. You can be a soldier in the Lord's army. You should just be honest with people and say that that is what the Christian life entails. You can engage or not engage, but I, I personally, uh, that's what God wants me to do. I want to do it. And that is what he wants us to do is engage in that spiritual battle.